um, in San Francisco, San Francisco Unified School District. I'm going to hand the microphone off to Claude, who's going to give us a little bit of a context setting, um, his larger vision. Um, I'll do some talking after Claude. Then we have a panel of three uh, School of Education uh, professors, and we have a, a few um, San Francisco Unified School District administrators here to talk as well. So um, also, just make sure you have um, a yellow map of the projects, and there's also um, an agenda slash small survey. There are extra copies in the back, and for people who need a copy of the PowerPoint, there are hard, cop hard copies in the back, but I will be emailing it out in a soft copy, so please only take it if you need it. Okay, here's our Dean of the School of Education, Claude Steele. Thank you, Laura. Um, first, I'm self-conscious about this. Can everybody hear me? Uh, it's, yeah. it's work. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I have uh, screwed that up a couple of times. So, <laughs> uh, I, my basic mission today is to uh, just sort of underscore how important I think this partnership between Susie and the San Francisco Unified School District is. It, 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 it really, I think, stands as a great model for how schools of education can relate to real school. Uh, districts in the most constructive way uh, possible. Uh, as I find myself saying these days a number of times, in education today, these are both the worst of times in some respects and, and the best of times. Uh, I think it's the, these are the worst of times for reasons that you, you are all uh, too uh, familiar with. There's a, a sort of intense budget slashing going on everywhere, uh, all across the nation. Uh, there's a lot of polarization uh, uh, in people's viewpoints about education and about almost every single aspect of e education, one side bashing the other side and, and so on. So there's a lot of heat and uh, sort of dust in the air around the topic of education. But I think uh, at the same time, underneath it all, there is uh, something that's, that's good, and that is uh, a, perhaps a broader recognition of the importance of education to our society, to the quality of life that we have in this society, and to the, the functionality of our, of our economy, and, and, and so on. And I think a part of that recognition is, is the recognition that uh, we need to be able to disseminate or distribute good education into low-income communities as well as into our other communities, that we really have to do a better job at educating our entire population. So I think almost more than any time in my uh, life, I think uh, those things are also true. Um, so one might ask the question, what role do schools of education have to play in this uh, era, in this era of, say, perhaps renewed interest uh, in, in education? And I, I, I first want to stress the, the, the fact that uh, I, I think schools of education have always played a profoundly important role in uh, American and international uh, education. I think sometimes that simple fact uh, gets uh, forgotten, but the research in these schools and the, tr the training models that are developed in, in these schools uh, provide uh, the basis for American schooling for, and, and really a big part of international schooling, for over a century now. So a lot of the knowledge that informs what, what it is like to go to school in the modern world comes from uh, schools of, of, of education. Uh, we just recently had a, a conference of, of uh, Finnish uh, educators, and as I'm sure you know, Finland is now wearing the white hat with regard to education. They're the ones that are seen as sort of the models of having the, the best, most equitable, uh, education system in, in the world, they in Singapore and Shanghai, uh, and they were very quick to point out that uh, almost everything that they have done to so quickly improve their education system over the last uh, number of decades uh, was, was, was taken from uh, American research, by, in, in biggest part, by American uh, research of American educators. So they're, they're not shy about crediting uh, at school for that. But this does uh, beg the question a bit. Uh, I think the, the deeper question right now is, is what, what, what role should we play now in this, in, in this era? How should schools of education really uh, contribute uh, most effectively to uh, education in, in, in our society? And it's there that I really do uh, offer 
uh, this partnership as I think want, as a very good example of, of how that can be done. Uh, this partnership between uh, the Stanford University School of Education and San Francisco Unified. I, I think that partnership represents a, a, a very important example of, of how schools, of how ed schools can uh, contribute. Um, and I think it does so in a, a couple of ways. I think it's a partnership that, uh, like all good partnerships, benefits both sides. I don't, I don't think you can say it benefits one, one side versus the, the, uh, the other side. Uh, I think it, it, I'd like to think it's true that, uh, that the, the Stanford School of Ed can bring a great deal of knowledge to the San Francisco Unified School District and in that way make some uh, uh, kind of, of contribution. I'd like to think that that's a, a part of this uh, partnership. Uh, but I also uh, think that the coordination between the two, the, the, the ability of, the, of, the, of San Francisco Unified to uh, point to areas of need that are most central to their functioning and to their sense of success, uh, that helps us target where, our, uh, where we can make the most uh, uh, contribution. And I think that, that, that integration of the two things, it's like any system that, that starts to be uh, integrated, the partnership better integrates the relationship between the school of education and a, and a big public uh, uh, school district. So I think in, in those respects, uh, that's one contribution. I will also say this, that as a researcher myself, I've always thought that a one source of basic insights and basic theory about education, about learning, and about other things, that one source of, of insight is grappling with practical problems. And in, the, in, in the, uh, the San Francisco Unified's ability to direct us to the most important problems to, to take up has a huge impact on improving our research and better targeting it toward the needs of, of the nation. So in all those respects, I really uh, hold this partnership as, as uh, something that's, uh, that we take very seriously here and that we see as a very important uh, part of our future. And I think you're just about to hear uh, a few great examples of, of how it works. So, so Laura's going to be here. Okay. Thanks, Bud. Um, so we wanted to give you a little bit of context setting about how this partnership became a little bit more formalized. Um, probably about three or four years ago, the then, then Dean of School of Education, Deborah Stipek, um, was brought together with the current superintendent, Carlos Garcia, by the president of the Silver Giving Foundation, Phil Halpern. And Phil had relationships with both um, the School of Education and the district and said, look, you guys have all these projects going on. Is anyone making sense of this? Or are you doing anything with it? Are you, um, you know, leveraging this relationship? And so the dean and the superintendent said, well, no, and we want to support this. Uh, so but one of the first things we did to really solidify this partnership was to map all the projects. Each of you have a map here. This map has changed over the last three years, and it's always a moving target. Um, you'll see um, that now most of the projects sit in um, what is referred to as a priority by the district cor the core curriculum um, and uh, or human capital. But that wasn't the case in the beginning. They were much more scattered. And partly I would attribute that to the growing relationship between the two organizations now um, that that shift has happened. Um, uh, another thing we did to really start um, to solidify the partnership was we built a common vision statement. Now, these are two unique, unique organizations that have very unique or different mission statements, correct? But those mission statements overlap just a little bit. And so what we did is we leveraged that and created a, a vision <coughs> together. And this is a vision we revise every year at an annual meeting we hold between the two organizations. This is the current vision, and it, you can kind of somewhat hear what Claude was talking about in his opening remarks in the vision. The partnership between Stanford University and the school, uh, San Francisco Unified School District supports and promotes innovative practical research and engages practitioners, policymakers, and academics in a dialogue about research findings and implications for decision making. The partnership helps Stanford research inform San Francisco's policies and practices, and Stanford learn from San Francisco's expertise with the goal of advancing student achievement in San Francisco and beyond. Um, but to talk about, uh, for a little bit about how we then help operationalize this um, 
partnership. I would say there's uh, around three buckets you can talk about. You could talk about my role, which I won't go into too much, but I, I somewhat, uh, as director of the partnership, help to um, stir the pot and make these things actually happen. Um, but the, uh, I, I would say the key piece is this network um, of relationships. Um, and what I refer to, as the, uh, what I'm talking about there is the, the agreements, the access, the operations that are necessary um, to happen. And then the, the network that needs to be in place between professors and researchers and uh, central office administrators and school site leaders to actually make these projects happen for them to materialize and be aligned with um, uh, district priorities. Um, you need that network of relationships. The other piece, and I make this larger um, circle, because this is the hope that um, this research is actually being considered, that it's something that's thought of when you're going to make a decision. There's lots of research out there about how decisions are made in school districts and other organizations. Um, um, however, we, we would hope that to shift that, um, that culture a bit and focus, have that um, decision making be a little bit more focused on the evidence, the data that dis disseminates from that research. And so there's a lot of work um, done on that through presentations like this, through briefs that are put out, through one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, there's lots of things I do as a director that people that are involved with the partnership do to help make this research um, considered in this situation. Um, so we're going to have three um, professors talk for a little bit. Um, and we've asked them to give a context for, they each are a part of a different uh, research organization that they've helped start at the school, uh, school of Education. I'll let them explain what they do. But um, I want, they, they each do one, uh, at least more than one project um, with the San Francisco Unified School District. So we've asked them to talk about how many and what type of projects they're working on. Give an example of at least one project in a little more depth. And really, we're trying to get at today that question of that great title that Pam Grossman came up with of what does partnering with districts like San Francisco do to actually help research matter? So we're hoping through their talk we get at that. So we're going to start with Susanna Lowe, um, and I'll hand it off to her. Let's see. Okay, let's see if I can talk into this and press these buttons at the same time. <laughs> that might be beyond my uh, technological capability. Okay, so um, I'm here to talk about SIPA. We're the Center for Education Policy Analysis, and our goal is to inform and advance policies for the benefit of students. And as, as part of this, we work with a num number of districts around the country, and we have a particularly close relationship with San Francisco. So that's SIPA. And when I was thinking about the different projects that we do, um, it wasn't quite, it wasn't as easy as one would think to group them into areas, but I think they can be grouped fairly nicely into three areas of human resources, student learning, school choice, and building collaborations. And so I just want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on in each of these areas. So um, as far as human resources, we have three projects. Can, is this going out to there? Can you just hold it right there? Okay, right up to my chin. <laughs> okay, so on, on uh, human resources, the first thing that we do is run human resource surveys in the district. So we survey um, teachers, assistant principals, and principals every year and have done so for, well, 2008, and then uh, this will be actually our fourth year doing it this year. Um, and, and in that, we, we collect information about uh, recruitment, hiring, development, retention, assignment for teachers and for school leaders with the idea of trying to, to understand broadly what's working in the district to identify uh, best practices and also to identify potential barriers or, or difficulties that are going on so that we can think about levers of reform. And these surveys have been important both on their own and then on how they relate to the other projects going on because since we have them there, we can see how projects then change things over time or uh, we can put special things on the survey in a particular year so that, uh, so that it informs the research in that area. 
Um, the second project talks about school leadership or looks at school leadership more carefully. We've been into every school in the district and observed principals for a day to, to see what they do and to see whether those actions or the kinds of skills associated with the, with the actions that they perform um, are associated with different kinds of school improvement. Um, and then the last one, which I'm particularly excited about right now, just because uh, we're, get, we're getting some results, is the evaluation of the Quality Teacher Education Act, which you'll hear, I think, a little bit more from, from Nancy and Heather Huff, who's in the audience, has been uh, leading this. But there, it's a 20-year parcel tax that was passed in 2008 that led to a whole bunch of human resource reforms in the district. And we've been looking both at the implementation of the, of the practices that came out of that with the hope of improving them and looking at the effect of the, of, of the increases in salaries and things like that on the recruitment and retention of teachers and actually on the effectiveness of the new teachers that come in. So the second area, which is a little bit broader of student learning, um, we, there are also three projects that I wanted to talk to you about. The, the first, oh, I forgot to say, when it has a star on it, it means that we look at this not only in San Francisco, but in other districts around the country, too. And what's nice about that is then we can look at San Francisco and, and what they're doing relative to other districts, as well as just trying to look at what goes on inside. So the first, the first project under student learning is effectiveness of different pathways for English learners. So in San Francisco, English learners have a have the option or the opportunity for a whole bunch of different pathways um, from dual immersion to um, English only and biliteracy. And uh, because we can trace kids over a 10 year period, we can really see how their trajectories differ in these different pathways. Um, the second project has to do with an observational protocol and related professional development uh, in English language arts, which Pam will talk about more, because this is joint work be between SEPA and CSET. And um, the last one is this early literacy formative assessment project, which I'm actually going to take a minute to talk about in more detail in the next slide. So the, the third area that we look at is school choice. And there we've been looking at the factors that parents consider when choosing schools for their students. Families have a, have a quite a bit of choice in San Francisco, so we can see how geography, the characteristics of the schools, the characteristics of the student populations, all affect where, where families are choosing to send their children to school. And what's nice is by understanding that, we can then simulate different kinds of assignment policies and uh, predict what the different assignment policies would do to the distribution of students in the district. And uh, our hope is by doing that, we can uh, you know, help inform the policies in that area. In a similar study, or a similar project, uh, Sean Reardon, who is probably here somewhere, is uh, part of the Student Assignment Plan Advisory Council. There was a new assi uh, assignment system set up this year, and the, the goal of this advisory council is to track the effects of this new assignment um, on the distribution of students across the district particularly trying to understand where, whether it helps reduce racially isol, racial isolation across schools. Finally, in terms of collaboration, we have, I think, two things going on. And the first is that we um, house a lot of the administrative data for the district in SEPA. And because of that, we can streamline um, the use of San Francisco data by Stanford researchers. San Francisco still, of course, has the ability to choose which projects they want, but what we can do is make sure that uh, they get that the data moves smoothly without too much work from the district. Okay, so I'm just going to go on to talk a little bit. I have one minute, so I might. I'll talk really fast um, about the early literacy formative assessment project. So because of this partnership, we're we're able to sit down and try to think about what's going on in the district. Uh, where we can be helpful and where we can learn things from what's go from what they're doing and by doing this we found that we had a shared interest in, in assessments and particularly formative assessments <coughs> and whether these assessments are beneficial and provide useful information or whether they're really not needed that that information is there already uh, the, while there were there's a bunch of assessments and a lot of investment in assessments going on in the district there's very little in early education but yet the district it was clear had an interest in uh, early literacy in particular. So this combination um, led us to a study of early 
um, assessments to assess early literacy and provide uh, information on, on the early literacy development of students in pre-K, K, and first grade. And we had dual goals of, of trying to see whether these assessments improve student success and also understanding the role of information um, and whether additional information for teachers is important um, at that level. So we considered a bunch of formative assessments. Um, did it cover pre-K through first grade? Did, was it in Spanish and English? What kinds of content was it there? We chose for the first year what's called the uh, PALS, the Phonological Awareness Literacy Screening that was developed at UVA, though one of the professors at Stanford was a big part of this development. Um, we randomly selected approximately half of the elementary schools in the district and um, went in with it this fall. So we've had the first set of assessments and what's nice about the, the way that we've done this is we can compare the schools that we have the that we put this into the schools that we don't. <coughs> to do this, I mean, one, there's providing uh, information, but the, the most important part about pro providing information is also providing um, it places for teachers to, to work through the information together and to think about what, what it means for their practice. So we've done a bunch of trainings around how you use the data. We have uh, facilitators who lead meetings around this, this data as well. Um, the role of SEPA has been to provide materials and trainings, substitutes and all of those things. And what's really nice in terms of the training part of uh, what SEPA does for doctoral students is it's uh, Ben York, who's the doctoral student leading this project, spends his 50% RA ship in the district uh, trying to provide logistical support for this and in the process is learning a lot about how the district operates that can both inform this study and really his education as well. For this year, we have two more assessments, more meetings of the teachers together, rounds, rounds of professional development, and our hope is maybe one more year of this too to see not only in the first year when it's ramping up, but after two years, whether this kind of information and support would be useful. So overall, the goals of this when we're done, the, the main questions we're, we're interested in asking is whether this kind of information and this time to work together with the kind of concrete data on student learning changes the teaching practices, which we're getting at largely actually through surveys. Um, changes access to services. Do the teachers now pull in services for the, the needs of the kids, which uh, these assessments aim to identify? Um, does it improve literacy development, which is the actual target of the, of the assessments that we have? But at the same time, does, does that improvement in literacy extend to other areas? You could imagine that either it would take away from other areas or support other areas. And we're looking at both math and at executive functioning and other kinds of social emotional skills. Okay, I'm just about out. But this is just one example of, um, as you can see, the whole range of stuff. So thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm particularly excited about this partnership between Suzy and San Francisco Unified because I'm a product of both. I'm a graduate of SFUS uh, D schools and also a product of Suzy. Um, the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching uh, is a relatively new center and like SEPA was a product of the K-12 initiative. Our mission focuses squarely on the improvement of teaching practices for the benefit of improved student learning, which aligns us very closely with the goals and mission of San Francisco Unified. Um, we also believe that we can only achieve these goals in collaboration with others. So partnerships like the one with San, Fran San Francisco Unified are absolutely critical for the kind of work that we do. Um, the center's work focuses both on research projects and on professional development opportunities for teachers. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about one of these uh, research projects that's called the Plato PD project, but I also wanted to focus a little bit on the kinds of professional development opportunities that uh, the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching provides for San Francisco teachers. Um, it's actually noteworthy that our very first professional development program, the Stanford Teaching Studio for Humanities and the Arts, 
was actually designed in collaboration with San Francisco Unified. Um, we identified the content of that studio in partnership with Daisy Santos, who was the humanities coordinator. She identified the content that San Francisco teachers needed to be working on, as well as the schools with whom we'd be working. So that very first program we started actually was in partnership with San Francisco. Uh, since 2009, we've worked with um, now over 350 teachers and principals in over 66 San Francisco schools. So we've really been sort of spread across the district. Um, and we work in partnership with a number of different departments and centers across campus, including, for example, Earth Sciences. We offer a program called Geoscape, a chemistry teaching studio. Uh, we work with the National Board and um, offer a Jumpstart, and also with STEP Partner School. So this is um, a partnership with many different uh, organizations across campus. Um, this is just a snapshot of the various programs that we're running right now uh, with San Francisco Unified. So you can see that they cut across a number of different content areas, humanities, science, math, um, as well as instructional leadership. And they include both, uh, many of these are both uh, research and professional development projects, as is, as is the example of Plato that I'll share with you. Um, and some of these actually were initiated by San Francisco. So uh, the work that we're doing with Area 1 principals came about because the assistant superintendents for Area 1 schools came to us and wanted to work on um, the issues of instructional leadership. So this has very much been a two-way collaboration where they'll come to us with some needs and things that we can do, and we've also brought various opportunities for them. So we were asked to talk about one project in particular, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Plato Project in San Francisco, which is focused on improving practice through structured observation protocols. Observation protocols have been in the news a lot these days. If you've been reading about teacher evaluation, you've probably also been reading about observation protocols. So in the race to the top and other legislation, um, they've been talking about using multiple measures for looking at the quality of teaching, and observation protocols are one of those measures. But observation protocols offer other resources for thinking about teaching. They offer a set of practices that in many cases have been linked to student achievement. They provide a common language for talking about teaching and its components, and a consistent lens for looking at instruction across classrooms, teachers, and schools. The protocol for language arts teaching observation, named by my then middle school aged daughter, was designed as part of a um, research project that was actually done in New York City in another partnership with a, a large district. Um, and there we were looking at practices of English language arts teaching that were associated with student achievement. We thought we could just pluck an observation protocol off the shelf. We were not planning to design our own, but it turns out there weren't any observation protocols for looking at secondary ELA. So we ended up developing the Plato instrument. Uh, Plato includes 13 different elements of high quality English language arts instruction that are organized around these four uh, factors of instructional scaffolding, the disciplinary and cognitive demand of activities in classroom discourse, teachers representation and use of content, and teachers management of time and behavior. I'm not going to go into all of those elements, but you can ask me about them later if you want. It requires observations of teachers across multiple lessons and across time, and has been used in the Gates-funded Measures of Effective Teaching Project, the Understanding Teacher Quality Project, and several research projects that we conducted uh, in New York City. So I had given an, um, a talk about Plato to the leadership in San Francisco Unified, and they were quite interested in thinking, and we were particularly interested and how you could think about using this kind of observation protocol, not for summative teacher evaluation, but for teacher improvement. So in our project, essentially what we're interested in is using Plato as a tool for professional development. 
And we've been working with four middle schools in San Francisco where we've collected diagnostic information about the quality of ELA practice in those schools. We've then taught the teachers involved with the project the Plato tool. So they've gotten the same kind of training that we give observers. They have identified two of the elements to focus on in targeted professional development, and they chose the two elements they scored lowest on, classroom discourse and strategy instruction. And we're now providing targeted professional development around those two elements. We meet with the teachers once a month, and we also meet with them in, uh, in a full day meeting, and then we also meet with them at the schools. They're beginning to share their practice. They're trying out some of these new things. It's really been very exciting. This is an example in which the district gets free professional development paid for by our IES grant. We get a site to do the research. What we're interested in is in what ways this kind of targeted professional development can first of all change teachers' practice and ultimately uh, change uh, students' achievement and learning, both on standardized achievement gains but also on um, writing assessments. So, let me just talk a little bit about, again, what we get out of it and what uh, San Francisco gets out of it. I would say that we, you know, we need the district. We can't do this work without schools, right? This is school-based. Everything we do is basically school-based research. So we need the district. And the district, in return, is getting, it had turned out that the ELA teachers hadn't had subject-specific professional development in a while. And they are getting very targeted subject-specific professional development. So we're both getting something. I also just want to say a moment of something about Laura's role, because this is a little bit like an arranged marriage. And every good arranged marriage needs a high quality yenta. And Laura is our yenta. She is the one who makes sure that we talk to the right people, that people in the district know what we're doing, that we know what other projects are doing, because it's a little bit like a polygamous relationship, right? <laughs> San Francisco has multiple relationships with different researchers here, and we need to know a little bit about that. And Laura does a huge amount of organizational and relational work to make this happen. So I just want to make sure that she gets recognized for the good work she does. So let me turn it on. Yay, Laura. Well, look at this yenta. <laughs> Would you allow that, Lee Shulman? <laughs> Hi, I'm Nobri McLaughlin, and here to talk about the John W. Gardner Center for Youth in Their Communities here at Stanford. And um, I just went to the wrong place. Return. No. What do I do? Back. No. Ah. I wanted that. Um, it's a little bit of a different center from the ones you've just heard about. The Gardner Center really is a cross-institutional center. And it looks at what we call community youth development, how the various institutions within and through which youth move contribute to uh, youth outcomes. So schools, of course, are front and center, um, but also health, mental health, juvenile justice, community-based organizations, um, First Five, Early Childhood, and all those, all those groups are all part of the Gardner Center's purview um, concerned about community youth development. So embarrassed. <laughs> um, the the project that's really front and center um, for our partnership with San Francisco and is a central part of the John Gardner Center is Youth Data Archive. And let me just say a little bit about that in a general term, and then show you how it works out in San Francisco in the project that I will well, that I, I, I will highlight. The Youth Data Archive um, links administrative data uh, across all these agencies you just talked about, so mental health, school, doing justice, out of school. And what's cool about it and challenging about it is it links data at the individual level, so it's not aggregate data. So I can follow Laura through her juvenile justice program. <laughs> um, you can kind of follow kids across institutions, um, which is... Um, interesting in terms of being able to move away from a traditional sort of uh, summative effect model and really begin to look to see how resources from various institutions contribute to youth outcomes. Another feature of the Gardner Center's work in the Youth Data Archive is its partnership with community members. So it really is a meet and confer and working with partners to understand what you call them called, grappling with serious, we, we grapple with our community <laughs> partners. 
Um, so we identify questions with them. We work to interpret analyses. We don't provide findings in a traditional social science sense, but rather say, here's what came out of these data. And work with them to develop implications for policy and practice. And because of that, and also because of this cross-institutional relationship, we really are third-party neutral. So we're able to have uh, data linkages, for instance, that many of our partners could not on their own have. Um, child welfare linked with uh, school district data, for example. The partnership we have with San Francisco uh, features a link between the district and the City College of San Francisco, and that's what I'll talk about in a moment. But the San Francisco partnership in general is really exciting to us on a number of grounds because San Francisco is a city and county. It really provides us a very rich, um, exciting way to begin to look to see how these institutions at both city and county level play out for you uh, within the San Francisco context. For example, we have a partnership with the Department of Children, Youth, and Their Families that has I think it's 230 agencies that serve youth in the, the neighborhoods of San Francisco. So this is something you can look at um, as, as well. Um, the project that I'll talk about uh, today is the Bridge to Success project in San Francisco that partners with San Francisco Unified and the City College of San Francisco, and I believe that San Francisco State is in the wings. Um, the, city, uh, the, the City College and the district were concerned about the fact that many of the San Francisco graduates didn't make it through City College. They didn't make it to graduation, or they didn't make it to a transfer to a four-year four -year school. And it was perplexed, you know, what's going on um, in this transition? So the, the Youth Data Archive linked uh, individual level, the San Francisco Unified data with the City College data for the first time. Um, any of the users who do K-12 and higher ed know that K-12 and higher ed very rarely talk to each other. So this is one of the first conversations, um, database conversations that was had in San Francisco. So the early findings, um, two kind of stand out as important. One is that uh, San Francisco graduates who do not enroll promptly in courses, and the core courses uh, at CCYF are less likely to earn a degree and to transfer to a four-year institution. Now, this is consistent with community college data across the country, but what's powerful about this, because of the individual matching thing, this is controlling for GPA and controlling for academic preparation. So it's not as though there's another kind of student who's not finishing. The very same students who graduate from San Francisco who do not enroll in the core courses are less likely to complete. Another interesting finding that I think connects Susanna a bit with what you talked about is the various, the varied alignment between uh, grades and traditional academic measures and achievement or um, success in the community college and placement. Um, it turns out you really can't predict a whole lot consistently um, looking at GPA or looking at California for the CST scores. Um, so based on that, there were a couple of policy changes that came about that we're excited about because they really are completely database. One is a priority enrollment for San Francisco Unified graduates. So there was a pilot last year, and this year um, there's a program in place that if you're an SFUSD graduate, you have a priority role in core courses at City College. Huge policy change. And second um, was the, adapt the adoption of the early assessment program as the placement program for City College. Since GPA didn't seem to predict anything, since CSC didn't predict anything consistently, what did predict um, at a very high level of reliability was the EAP the students took in the 11th grade. So both math and English departments are now using these, these measures um, to place their students. Again, big policy change. The broader partnership um, with San Francisco was through the San Francisco Research Consortium and with Susanna's group, we're kind of participating in that and it's just in its early stages. We've just, this year, begun to have, have some meetings. And what's exciting about that is the table that's set there Leadership from the district, leadership from the mayor's office is there, um, leadership from City College, from San Francisco State, so that when data and analyses come through the Youth Data Archive and through this partnership, they're really able to act on them. Um, Odette Durant, who's sitting there, can tell you that as the, as the data came out about the placement practices, the chancellor said, um, we're gonna change, we're gonna do something different. So it's a close relationship between 
leaders who propose problems and grapple with issues and the ability to turn around and implement them right away. So this is kind of our future um, uh, with San Francisco. We very much look forward to it. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask the professors to switch, and now we're going to have our district, district administrators come up and join. We have a special guest here who just ha who couldn't stay away. Superintendent Carlos Garcia is here. So Nancy, Carlos, come on up. we're going to get Carlos to give some final remarks, but Orla and Nancy are here. Um, and they're going to talk about two projects in particular, um, I think both of which have been mentioned, but they're going to describe how um, they use the Stanford Research Projects to inform their decision making and what um, partnering with Stanford does to actually help them, help with their work at the district. So here's Nancy. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Um, my name is Nancy Waymack, and I'm the Executive Director of Policy and Operations for the School District. And my role here is around the implementation of the partial tax that Susanna mentioned earlier, the Quality Teacher and Education Act that was passed in 2008. And this, the point of this partial tax was really to improve teacher quality generally and to recruit, retain, and professionally develop our teachers in a, an effective way. And as we negotiated this agreement with the teachers union to put something on the ballot, we had a lot of things in mind that we wanted to do, but we didn't necessarily have a specific research base behind them. Um, and as we did this, we wanted to make sure we were documenting the process along the way. And so enter, enter Heather Huff and colleagues from SEPA and PACE and they were kind enough to document the process along the way. There's now a case study narrative that talks about the process we went through to come up with what went to the ballot and what the voters um, eventually passed. And then we started looking at how we were implementing. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were evaluating eventually the actual policies that we had put into the parcel tax rather than the level of implementation. And the surveys that Susanna talked about earlier were a big part in letting us know what was happening and for what reason. Uh, one of the things that we did was we gave teachers an extra 18 hours of professional development throughout the year. And they had some flexibility in using that. Some was school-based, some was up to them, and some was more district-based. Um, I don't know if you can see the little graph on the side of this slide. But it tells, um, tells us reasons that the teachers who didn't use all of their professional development, why they didn't use it. So that was a really important finding for us, or a question for us to ask, because we needed to tweak those, those things. Some people said they didn't have time. Okay, what can we do about that? What are we doing to work uh, professional development into the school day or to otherwise create circumstances where they have time to get their professional development? If they didn't like the options, well, maybe we need to go back and see what the options are and how to address them. So there were a number of questions like that that helped us understand how implementation was going, um, what things we needed to communicate better, uh, where communication was working and where it wasn't, who people were listening to, uh, where they were getting their information. So all those things helped us actually implement better. And now we're getting to the point where we're actually looking at the evaluation of what's happening. And we've got, um, as Susanna mentioned, some really exciting things um, that we're seeing about our applicant pool. Uh, we, can, we can now see that our applicant pool has changed since we implemented Prop A, Prop A, Prop A 2008. We have a number of Prop A's in San Francisco that are education related. Um, and it's really exciting to see that we're competing more strongly with other districts that have higher, higher pay. And so we're going out there with the, with the Walnut Creeks and with the Palo Altos, maybe not all the way with the Palo Altos, but we're getting closer. Um, so that those teachers that are looking at those districts are also looking at San Francisco. So that's a really exciting piece of news for us and we're, we're looking forward to seeing it in print soon. Um, and now we're also making changes along the way. One of the things that our superintendent says over and over is that we're uh, a district who needs to make sure that we are um, 
following a model that is improving with every step and um, looking at what we're doing. If we're sitting on a dead horse, get off, right? That's the the uh, motto for today, at least. And so as we look at the things that we've implemented, if they're not working, um, we're going back to the table and proposing changes to make sure that we can improve upon that going forward. And um, we have a lot of money invested in Prop A and a lot of effort and a lot of teacher time invested in these things, and we want them to be effective. And so the work that uh, CEPA is doing to evaluate Prop A is really guiding us to make those decisions going forward. And it's also providing an objective um, third-party view, if you will, as we sit down with the union to have these conversations. So that's that's been a really, really valuable um, component of our partnership. And I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to Orla. Thanks, Nancy, and thanks, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And as Pam said, we both benefit from the partnership. It really is uh, wonderful to have this opportunity. It gives us access to skills and knowledge to deal with really complex issues that we wouldn't be able to deal with by ourselves. So the partnership's really important. And it also gives us an opportunity to um, examine deeply the implications of some of the policy decisions that we make. So not just helping us develop policy, but also begin to understand the impact that policy is having. So I'm Orla O'Keefe. I'm a special assistant to the superintendent. And um, today I'm going to talk about one of the initiatives that I've been working on and how the partnership with Stanford has really helped with that. So recently the district uh, re developed a new student assignment policy. And as we were working to develop that policy, our partnership with Stanford helped in uh, multiple ways. Um, Prudence Carter was involved with doing a qualitative study to help us to meet with students and teachers at schools to have an understanding of the connections between diverse enrollment and student experience and student outcomes. And also working with uh, Tukana and some of her, the partners that she works with at Stanford, looking at connections between uh, diverse enrollment and achievement outcomes for students. And that was part of the policy development work that we were doing. The goals for student assignment are very uh, complex. And uh, I think it was Susanna mentioned earlier about exploring kind of where policy and practice converge and how well it works or doesn't work. And that's something we definitely rely on partnerships to help with that. <coughs> so our goals for a student assignment are to reverse the trend of racial isolation and the concentration of underserved students in the same schools, provide equitable access to the range of opportunities, and have transparency at every stage of the process, all the while using family choice as a, as a, a tactic for achieving those goals really, really complicated, right? So we're very lucky that a couple of professors from Stanford are helping us monitor this to see, is it, are we reaching the goals, the intended goals? Is the policy working as intended? Um, or you know, what impact is it having? So luckily, Sean Reardon and uh, Prudence Carter, as well as a partnership with McCall Kurlander from UC Davis are the three advisors helping the superintendent and us as staff really monitor the impact of the policy. So helping us think about what are the questions we should explore, what data should we look like, look at, how should we look at that data. And we're just about to generate our first annual report um, under the new student assignment policy. And luckily, we will have uh, their partnership and help in really trying to understand what that analysis is telling us. Like, what are the implications and what does it mean for us from a practical perspective in terms of our policy and how we should adjust it. So, um, and that's just one example, and we're very lucky in, in working towards our strategic plan holistically for the district and making sure that we're having every opportunity to leverage all the resources that are available. So talking about, when you were talking earlier about access to professional development, which is critical, and in a time of diminishing resources, it's really great to have partnerships like this that give us access to resources that we otherwise wouldn't have. So um, I thank you very much for your partnership. I'm, feel very fortunate for it, and um, I'm glad to be here. So thank you, Laura, for putting it on. Thank you, Laura. Um, so we did reserve time for Q&A um, in the end, but since we have him here, I thought I'd give Carlos an opportunity to say a couple comments just from what he's heard. And, um, well, thank you for the cliff notes. I, I mean, the, the amount of things that you covered in such a short time is, 
is utterly amazing. But I want to thank Claude for hosting this. This is great. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And I also want to thank Ritu Khanna, who just does fabulous work with all of us, you know, uh, in research and evaluation. We, we couldn't do it. We wouldn't have the capacity. We didn't have somebody that smart to be able to figure out how we do all of this. Uh, you know, when I look at all these partnerships, uh, and as we've developed them, I'm, this is my fifth year in San Francisco, I have to tell you, it's, it's like a dream come true. Um, I know that universities and school districts sometimes are paths uh, don't always cross at the right juncture. And I think they definitely did here in San Francisco because what happened was, you know, we, I, I've learned a long time, I've been in this business 37 years. I've learned that we all make a lot of assumptions, but usually our assumptions are overwhelmingly wrong. Um, and, and yet, you know, I always tell people we're sometimes stuck on stupid because we think that things are a certain way and the world's always changing and things aren't at all like what we think. And what this does is, you know, I'm, I sound like a broken record because I always tell people, I guess because I'm getting older, is that, you know, quite frankly, I don't give a damn what you think and you shouldn't give a damn what I think. <laughs> the facts are in the data. You know, the, the data is doesn't lie, doesn't take political sides, doesn't do all the rhetoric, it just tells you what is and not what you want it necessarily to be. And where we're at, it was just so nice to set up partnerships that said, you know, we've, you know in this business we have a lot of uh, institutions, higher ed, coming to us, who are doing studies, want to do thesis, all these different things. And, and all, all, all that's great for all you folks, but it wasn't good for us. Because what good is all that if we're not going to help with all, having all that research to empower school districts to actually provide a better place for kids. I mean, ultimately, it's about educating children. And I don't work for adults, I work for kids. And so I was, I was kind of hard-nosed with some of these people in the room, where I said, you know, that sounds great, but how is that going to improve our practice in our school district? I'm tired of having the autopsy model that we all use in public education where at the end of something we find out if it worked. Well, it's a little bit late. The patient already died. You know, I want to know, is it working as we go? And from the get-go, is Prop A actually doing what we said it's going to do? Is Bridge to Success going to get us where we need to go? Uh, it needs to be action-oriented so that we actually use everything that comes our way to, to make changes in what we're doing because you're right you know we're not going to continue doing something and, and in an economic crisis that we're living in today we can't help but to have to do things that work we no longer have a luxury i'm not sure we ever did but we certainly don't have it now to try to spend resources in places that that don't get us results thank you all because without your help we would not be we're penny pinching but we're using it effectively to be very strategic on what we can fund and what works and what will ultimately educate and make a school, a public school district what it needs to be. I mean, we cannot afford to not have great public school districts in America. And the work that you're doing with us is going to assure that we're always going to get better. When she said, I always talk about getting better, I solely live on a Kaizen model. We constantly have to look at our warts, everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and concentrate on how do we make it better. And I, for that, I'm grateful to all of you, and Claude, for all of Stanford University stepping up to help a school district, a public school district, become better. Thank you very much. take one minute and just encourage you, you each have a survey in front of you if you want to fill it out during the Q&A. There's a box in the back to hand it in. We appreciate, we use the survey as just feedback on what we're doing and um, on the partnership in general. Um, we have a group of professors and administrators here that are happy to answer your questions. Um, so I'll open it up to you. Are there questions in the audience? Sure that there is an overburden on, I guess, the workers and staff. So 
going to repeat the question just so we have it on film. So the uh, question is, with all the expectations that go along with the different research projects, the time, commitment, who winds up managing that? Is it the professors? Is it the administrators? How, how exactly does How is it coordinated and how does it work? Does anyone want to manage that in particular or answer that? Ritu, <laughs> as you can see, we have two special guests here. Ritu Khanna is the head of the research department. You can give her a warm hello. Well, we do meet, Laura and I have weekly meetings where we actually look at each project and then see its implications for research, for professional development within the district, and also in terms of policy. But over and above that, we actually only will allow 10 projects at the most to happen in San Francisco so that we can make it manageable and actually see it filter into the system versus having you know, many various uh, numerous projects that don't really you know, have the uh, impact. And also it has to really fit in with some of our objectives. So even what you saw right here, Bridge to Success, the mission of the district is to make the students college and career ready. So Bridge to Success fits in. You know, formative assessments or even student discourse that was mentioned in the Plato project. Those are things we need, uh, or paradigm shifts that we need to make within instruction for us to be ready to implement the core curriculum state standards. So, you know, we do choose our projects and then invest more in them based on direction. Anyone else want to add to that? I, I just would add that, you know, we do have partners. I know Phil's back there, um, Phil Halford, but the Alliance, a lot of different foundations have helped us to sponsor some things, and the joint fund positions so that we could do this kind of work because we're broke, we have no money. You know, so, so it really helps having other people step up to, to, to see the need for that, of having someone, I'll tell you, Laura has been invaluable because of the fact that uh, how do we speak the same language? Uh, when we started some of these things, we would say to people, well, wait a minute, we can't do this because we don't have the capacity to do it. So we had to get our heads together to think of, well, how would we fund positions that would maybe allow us to be able to do this kind of work? And, and that's really what's made us successful. I'll just add to that, too. Some of the projects that have now been funded actually fund people within San Francisco Unified School District to do some of the things to prepare, to support studies, that then the results actually inform the district. For example, the EL Pathway Studies was funded by an IAS grant with the help of the Strategic Educational Research Partnership, leading the way there, and Sean Reardon at Stanford. And so that actually funded the person in Ritu's research department to clean up the EL data. Um, but it's a really good question. I would say it, it's a balance between Stanford tends to have very good project managers um, for each of their projects, and they do a lot of the legwork. I think Susanna talked about Ben York with the early literacy uh, project. Um, I wind up working more with the central office dis district administrators, and then the project managers do more with the school site personnel. Any other questions? Yep. Hi. Um so correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is currently there you have Stan of oh, well, these wonderful Stanford projects and organizations, they are doing all this research related to uh, align with the SFUSD uh, goals. And so then we have something like PD to implement this the research findings. Um, so is there anything being done to make sure that it's implemented correctly or that people are held accountable to make sure that you know, we are getting the results formatively and not just summatively? Yeah, the, do you guys want to answer that? I, yeah, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it relates, yeah, I mean, I think that's really our goal is, is uh, that we're quite active involved in the professional development that goes on with these projects. Pam is designing the one for hers. We, we uh, Grace is back there on the early uh, literacy study uh, has kept up. We bring someone in to do the professional development because it's not our area of expertise, but but we follow what they do and we've been collecting a lot of information about the principal's assessment of whether it's going well as well as
as the things that we can find out in the long term after we get uh, the information back. Even little things like do the teachers use it, do they put it in, we collect those things as we go along to, to get a sense of whether it's being implemented or developed. Uh, for us, it's, it's also collecting a lot of data um, on the formative piece of this. So as we're doing the professional development, we're doing cycles of observation in the schools. So we're actually going in and seeing what people are doing along the way, not just at the end. So yeah, we built that in. And I'll just say then, both, I mean, all three of the organizations you saw up here then feed reports back to the district that, that they meet with the district and talk about the implementation and what they see going on, as well as the, their forming results. Um, so that's a good question. I think we have time. Yeah, I just don't want to understate Laura's role in that when we do this work, she really makes sure that the people who need to hear about it are the ones that hear about it. So we may work with one person most of the time, and then she figures out lots of time where we need to go. So Odette's saying that the director plays a role in kind of making sure that network uh, communication takes place. Sorry, I just wanted to get that record. But I think we had a couple other questions. I think one over here, yes? Is the 10 Project um, related to your current funding, if there were more funding, could there be more projects, or is that like a, a good amount that you want to stay with? Well, me too brought that number up because you get many different applications that can stem from all over the spectrum on the Stanford campus, and so I think the idea is to limit the projects the, the, according to the, re the guidelines that SFUSD presented their own research agenda which is basically in alignment w with their strategic goals. And that's been new. At first, when I came to the district, it was, I all joke, you were a yes district. They were saying they were saying yes to lots of different projects. I mean, I came, there were 40 different Stanford research projects going on. So now, um, I would say it's definitely shifted, and it is limited. The projects um, you'll see, though, here, they, um, are, they're, they're not just research, okay? They're also sometimes providing a, sorry, I'm gonna go back. They're sometimes providing a service to the district, sorry. They're also sometimes providing a service to the district that maybe comes through a different funding source or something to that extent. So there's not just research going on. For example, there's the CLAD online classes. That is something that Stanford created um, but it's not necessarily research in its classes that some of the uh, few teachers that need to have the cloud certification actually take. So that wouldn't fit under the umbrella of what Ritu was talking about, yet it still goes on within the partnership. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to get a read on whether you'd like to have proposals. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, uh, so the question is, if does SFUSD want more proposals? It depends. Uh, it depends. It really no, depends. No, no. If, if it's value added to our strategic plan, if it, because we literally, we get hundreds of not only Stanford universities all over asking us to do things, and, and really it's things that, that are for them, not for us. So unless it's going to, you know, we have three uh, goals that we have in our strategic plan, unless it really adds value to those three, we don't want to do it, and we're not going to do it, because we don't have the capacity to do it right. And in the final analysis, what do we get out of it? I hate to sound selfish, but selfish is good sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and I see San Francisco shifted to being much more strategic about those projects. So take a look at their strategic plan and say, does this? Are, are they going to want to do this? And I'm happy to talk to anyone who's interested in terms of if you have a potential project. Yeah, I think I have another question over here. Sorry, I'll come back over here. I'm, I'm kind of wondering about the longevity of the partnership. I understand that this type of district-focused research that's really in line with the strategic plan is something that is important now, but also in 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, um, whereas I understand maybe a partnership like this has a time limit on it. So I'm wondering, what's the plan going forward? Are there plans for shifting this type of research into district resources, um, like independent of Stanford, or is there a vision for that sort of thing? So the question is basically, is there a vision for the future of the partnership and the longevity of the partnership? Like right? super long term. Yeah. Yes, very long term, 20 or 30 years out. Anyone want to, I mean, I, Claudia, you want to talk? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I see this as really essential to what ed schools do and, and what they can do. And 
So I see it as a growing, uh, ascending commitment. That's something that's, that's time limited in any way at this point, really. I see it as something that uh, we have an opportunity to be leaderly in, in implementing. And so uh, our, you know, our, our, our commitments are, are not, uh, you know, there's no window on them at this point. We really intend to, to stay in here. I, I would also say, I, I think there's a, I, like everybody, I've been reading Steve Jobs' biography. <laughs> and uh, there's an interesting principle at in how he ran Apple with kind of an end-to-end -end focus. He wrote that they did the hardware, the software, the, the user interface. They did every part of it. And that and they when they were in a room planning things, all, all parties were there. And so they got a, a more, more integrated plan in, uh, beneath their, to organize their product. And, and I think that's what this partnership does for, for, for uh, education research. It gives us a more integrated focus and kind of research. It has more integrity to it. So I see it as a real uh, uh, discovery. Okay, one, some other question here? Uh, right. um, uh, I'm a business star from China, from being on the facts of education. And also, we, our facts of education has come to be part of the public projects cooperating uh, with the Beijing municipal districts, uh, such as the green uh, education, right? The large one, just like uh, what happened here. Uh, you know, just the professors in the university are very busy, right? Not only from teaching, but also research and different kinds of the projects. I'm just wondering how the professors here, as well as education, have just to keep their, make sure their energy and the time on this kind of the projects. Because you see that uh, maybe a school of education staff at the university has got the contract, I mean from the organizational level, have the contract or sign the contract with the SFA, the SUD, right? So how, what the function of the school of education? Uh, how the school of education staff at the university make sure this kind of the project could be processed efficiently? And uh, individually, how the professors here participate in this project, right, can make sure their time, full time, or just to, energy to put in part into this kind of project. So both from an institutional perspective and from an individual professor, right. how do you manage the time and resources and everything that's expected of this? So um, I just, again, want to reiterate what Laura said earlier about the, um, first of all, high quality pro uh, project managers. So Carolyn Cantor is the project manager for the Plato Project. Um, and we also have a superb executive director, Susan O'Hara, who people who are managing both the individual projects and the overall center. Um, so there are things built into our centers that help us manage that work, and they're very important in order, just as San Francisco Unified needs that kind of capacity, we need that capacity in order to keep these projects going. The other thing I would say, though, is the role of doctoral students, and Susanna touched on this. I have eight doctoral students working on my Plato project, and they're a terrific crew. They're, they are former teachers themselves. They bring experience in districts like San Francisco Unified. They are excited about doing work that is very connected to practice and enjoy being out in the schools. So I see, again, our role as um, preparing the next generation of doctoral students who can continue on this kind of work that's very rooted in practice, who understand what it means to work with a school district and to build those kinds of relationships. So they're the, they're the professors of the future. So it's not just the work that we're all doing, but in Millbury, I know it's prepared lots of doctoral students who've gone on to do this kind of work. And I see that both as part of our, our role as professors, but also our investment in the future of these kinds of partnerships. Yeah, I, I completely agree with what Pam said. But the other, the other thing too, I mean, the doctoral students are incredible, as are the project managers. But the other thing is that these, these relationships that, uh, require a fair amount of infrastructure to understand the data, to understand the policies that are going on, to create the relationships. And I really think that's what the, the centers that you hear from at Stanford, as well as Laura and the, the people willing to work with us in San Francisco, um, help us develop that, that make each project a lot smaller of a step than the first project was. And I think by, by creating what we have here, we've really made it so much easier for other people to, to come in and do this. And, and uh, that's what I hope we build as a school of education here, is uh, the ability to make these things run smoothly. You know, <laughs> I want to just add that um, I think Stanford is a little unusual um, in schools of education, and there's a permeability um, among 
along teaching and research and, and working with students, it, it's always felt to me of a piece. So I didn't feel pulled in one direction or pulled in another direction. So um, again, wonderful doctoral students out working in the field. Um, I get a chance to work with wonderful people in the district. So it, it, it informs my teaching. So it doesn't feel compartmentalized in that way. And I can speak only for Stanford, and I think that's a, a characteristic of this, this institution. <laughs> So I want to actually uh, call it to a close. I really appreciate you coming, and I know there's some other questions up there. I think people will be free to mingle and answer questions if they have time. I just want to uh, point out um, and thank the Silver Giving Foundation, um, and um, as well as the School of Education and San Francisco Unified School District who are hosting this event. We're hoping that this is a, this is the you know can be a model for other pro uh, partnerships out there. Um, again, I want to encourage you to fill out your survey and put it in the box in the back. That would be great. Um, and again, any other questions, please come up and see um, the people on the panel. Thank you very much.